Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Trouble in Ireland that we've been running the series on. This is episode five. It's called, I've called it The Bloody Road to Politics. Um, we're dealing with the partition of Ireland and its consequences. So in this picture here behind the writing, you can see uh, the sort of mass demonstrations that came out of the, out onto the streets during the during the hunger strikes. Um, this mobilized a, ma a vast number of people in Ireland who probably never had anything on, like on such a scale since. The, um, both parts of Ireland, uh, they came out in these sort of numbers. Right, so on the surface, uh, 1974, which is where we left it in episode four, uh, 1974 it started with just another political failure, that being the, that, the collapse of the Sunningdale Agreement, which was in gestation between the British um, state and uh, s certain elements of the loyalists crowd, the Unionist Party, uh, was in in uh, in negotiations, as was the Social Democratic Labour Party. That's the Nationalist successor party to to the Nationalist Party. And um, in the wings. The IRA, the provisional IRA, were also uh, represented by by Sinn Fein, which is their political organization. However, this, um, as we saw at the end of, of part four, uh, th this uh, this agreement had collapsed, and um, and it it looked as though this was just going to herald more more violence in the street. Uh, 1972 had been the most violent year of the, of the lot in terms of there had been about, about 500 deaths. Um, it's 1973 was a, a few less, um, it, it, but it looked as though 1974 was going to be pretty much the same, which in many ways it was. However, um, all this was instructive in that it showed that there was a hesitant willingness both in certain quarters of the UK government and provisional Sinn Féin, who reached some sort of a, uh, an agreement. The hard reality was that neither side was capable of achieving a military victory, and the provisional guerrilla stroke bombing campaign to drive the Brits out in square scare quotes was ob most obviously not working and worse for the provost, it was starting to flag, uh, meaning that they were getting less volunteers. Uh, the, the recruitment was, was starting to ebb and the, um, and the amount of, of uh, operations that they could carry out was was um was also ebbing, and um, uh, partly because they'd actually bombed pretty much everything to a standstill in in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, completely. So so there were so there really wasn't wasn't much else that they could bomb, <laughs> apart from British Army um, bases and so on. The problem with the settlement, however, was that the provisionals were not yet ready to lay down their arms without significant concessions. And the British establishment was still determined to achieve something that they could spin off to the world as being a British victory. Uh, to complicate matters, the Loyalists under the Reverend Ian Paisley had also used their sabotage of Sunningdale. Uh, they'd sabotaged it in what was known as the Ulster Workers' Strike. You can see a mass crowd seen from that up in the top right uh, of this picture. 
um, and they used the um, their their collective sabotage of this of this agreement because it actually left them out. I mean that that was the basic the basic uh, reason for it. Um, but it was it was being used as a means to ensure that they could not be ignored by either party in any further talks. So in the absence of political dialogue, the divisions and the brutality were all set to intensify onto a whole new level. But this time with a cruel difference, the new round of violence would be increasingly localized and contained. This directly relates to British policy at the time, which we will be looking at. Within the loyalist camp, the Ulster Workers um, Council strike uh, in position uh, or pictured above had cemented Paisley's political ascendance. And in the process, it eclipsed the old unionist party run by the uh, upper class, who were mostly English accented bigwigs. It had also marginalized, was to marginalize the Vanguard party, which is a new organization within, within loyalism um, led by William Craig. Um, but Paisley was much more uh, astute and on the ball than William Craig ever was. So from, from now on, it would be the unionism of the shopkeeper, the small farmer and the preacher that would speak out loudest in, in their name. The working class would still be relegated to the sidelines in this. However, nationalist politics remained under the reformist professional class of the SDLP. Um, this being mainly people like doctors and lawyers and teachers and people like this. This is what I mean by professionals in this in this because um, the the um, the uh, nationalist or Catholic population hard, hardly owned any businesses, so it was it was really professionals that uh, formed the elite within within the Catholic community. So running out of fresh volunteers in Ireland due to the high casualty and capture rate, uh, the provost attempted to switch focus to England to try and bomb England out of Ireland um, as, in the same way as they tried to, to bomb Northern Ireland um, out of out of out of Britain. Uh, this was in, in an effort to draw media attention to the struggle once again. Media attention was starting to flag by 1974. Uh, people were, were no longer so interested in the in the in the conflict. Uh, who, uh, un unless you were from Ireland. These results were disastrous for for the for the provisionals public relations. Uh, such as the Birmingham, uh, you can see uh, one of the Birmingham bombings up above, and the Guildford pub bombings. Um, these were hugely unpopular in in amongst the British British popular population. didn't didn't help win any any allies, and it also played straight into the hands of uh, British criminal struck terrorist propaganda. Now, whether these bombs were 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 um, were went off intentionally is still not. Um, it, you, you, while there was lots of people in there, we, we, we don't know. But but there was a hell of a lot of people killed. Um, but uh, the the there there may have been warnings given, but if so, it was a bodged bodged both both incidences were bodged bodged operations and not only this but the campaign simply created a backlash against the irish in britain um the irish already being a sort of marginalized group within within britain so that right wing elements or agents of the state such as the police 
they suddenly felt legitimated to wreak violence and spite against anyone who was identified as Irish, uh, such as the Birmingham Six. They had to find find people and uh, frame them up for for these for these bombings. We still don't know exactly who who carried them out. Well, we know it's a provisional IRA, but beyond that, we don't know who the individuals were. But the um, so so what they did because they 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 uh, they hadn't any intelligence on the on the uh, on the incidents. Then then they they um, they 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 basically framed up uh, innocent building workers. Certainly in the case of the Birmingham Six, um, also the Guildford Four. Um, and uh, you, you can you can see them here appearing in the in the pictures that were taken in the police cells just after interrogation. Um, yeah, right. They they don't look as though they they they've been beaten up, haven't they? You know that that's fairly obvious. And in fact, it, it took them nearly twenty years of fighting both both groups to actually win their freedom. Um, and initially, no, nobody was interested in representing them at all. Uh, so, so they pretty much lost most of their lives in side jails for things that they hadn't committed. Uh, so, so, so these in, innocent building workers were framed as the culprits, and they were forced to sign pre-prepared confessions. This eventually came out in the in the in the retrials that freed them right so if you remember we were talking about the official the official and the provisional republican movement uh with the official republican movement we sort of left toward about the middle of of episode four because they their operations were winding down at least their offensive operations were winding down um but within the official Republican movement, um, things were also coming unstuck here. They'd been left on the sidelines by the uptick of provisional activity in 1972-73. And two things had started to happen. Firstly, the largely Dublin-based leadership began to shift towards what the provost had in fact accused them of initially. Um, they weren't doing it then, but they certainly were doing it by the middle of the 1970s. Um, in, in, they were giving clear signs that they just wanted to become a 26 county party um, and leave the north pretty much um, uh, and maintain socialist pretensions. Uh, focused entirely on electoral politics. So it was all going to be about getting your TDs or MPs in English into the doyle of the, the Irish Parliament. Um, and secondly, this did not sit well with the, because the, there was a radical revolutionary wing, mainly based in the North, but also based in the South. And they were focused on a united 32 county workers republic um these people included Seamus Costello whom you can see in the picture on the bottom left uh the picture on the bottom of the top right this is the uh Irish National Liberation Army uh one of their banners that was to emerge about about this time uh, the Irish National Liberation Army emerged out of the Irish Republican Socialist Party. We're going to deal with that now. So in 1974, there was a split. Um, so the officials um, were the the radical wing of the of the officials uh, formed their own Irish Republic Irish Socialist Republican Party. The the um, Irish Republic. The IRSP, and um, this was mainly strong in the north, as we've already said, especially in Derry and in the Lower Falls. 
um, of region of Belfast. Not so much in the country areas, but there were some because of familial ties. There were also some in in places like South Armagh, South Tyrone, and, and places like this. Um, and it, its its armed wing was to be known as the Irish National Liberation Army or INLA. It needs to be stressed that at the outset. The, the IRSP looked as though they might be a strong um, challenger to both the officials and the provost due to the high caliber of the people it was attracting. Now, these were both political and military, in fact, but um, we will be mainly concerned with the political figures who included Seamus Costello. He was very famous. He served in the in the border campaign in the 19, 1950s. He was well renowned as being both socialist and a Republican. Um, and Bernadette Devlin, who um, who if you if you remember, she was actually elected for People's Democracy um, and she was MP in um, for I think a couple of years at the at the at the outset of the of the struggle um, over over civil rights and um, and both these people and various other people that was attracting were were really top notch activists and um, so there so there was and and they had appeal in both the north and in the south. And there was, and there was a good chance that they might be able to to uh, to to succeed both the both the officials and the provost. However, within a very short time, the RSP was subjected to a savage assassination campaign started by the official leadership. Um, and these took out uh, Seamus Costello. He was murdered in Dublin and um, and several others as well. Uh, a friend of mine was actually killed uh, at the outset. Um, well, well, he wasn't killed, but his brother was killed at the outset in Belfast on a building site, I think. The the new um, this is this is carried out by the official IRA. Um, these were the armed wing of the official um, Repu uh, official Republican movement, soon to be called the Workers' Party. So the new INLA responded in kind, um, and this led to a bloody feud and only added to the mess. Bernadette Devlin herself, she left shortly afterwards, complaining that politics was once again being subordinated to the dominance of armed struggle because the armed struggle was basically taking, taking over all considerations within the movement. Our British strategy was on one level changing too, but they had not yet given up on the Kitson style obsession in total victory by any, 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 any means necessary. A big military advantage the provost had had over the 1972 to 73 period, which they were had, and now in the process of squandering, however, was the adoption of the cell structure. Now the cell structure was was uh, was a way of breaking down the old battalion structure, which they'd been been uh, been operating under before, as a means to to uh, to limit the ability of British intelligence to to penetrate it. Um, and it was true that in the 1972-73 period, the British intelligence was finding it nigh on impossible to penetrate it. Um, and this made the occupier look helpless and the IRA seem more invincible than they really were, most importantly in the eyes of the world's media. So the British solution would be twofold. 
first of all, to use, um, in because as I say, the in, by 1974, IRA campaign is flagging, actually by late 1973, it's flagging, and the um, and they need ceasefires. They need ceasefires in order to 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 uh, to build back their their strength. But it, the ceasefires also the short term ceasefires that they started to have. Um, these also allow the British an opportunity to start infiltrating the IRA cells cell structure and the other part of the british solution would be to ulsterize the problem now this is a becomes a word which i think is actually known in, in um as a as a real word <laughs> nowadays it's called ulsterization <clears throat> meaning to localize uh, you know to make it make a problem much smaller than it was originally um, by withdrawing British troops and replacing them with uh, local stand-ins, uh, such as the Royal Ulster Constabulary, you can see one of them below, the uh, bottle green clad police force with um, armoured with assault rifles and sidearms and in uh, bulletproof jackets on the streets and the uh, Ulster Defence Regiment, who were the replacement, the UDR, they were the replacement to the, to the former B Specials. If you want to know what these organisations are, refer back to earlier episodes. Uh, this way, the ongoing conflict could, in theory, be contained marginalized and forgotten about by the media. This was the British intention of this period. Uh, apart from these changes, the overall Kitson strategy was to remain in place. British military intelligence were to be given a much larger backroom role and a, the chance to redeem their earlier failures. Using the local ROUC, on the right and UDR together with their in into their web of intrigue that also went deep inside loyalist paramilitary and political political circles to drive the Kitson agenda forward. We will in episode six we will be dealing with how far it got into the political circles. Uh, in this episode we'll show how far it got into the the uh, military circles. So this was the, the strategy that was to lead to the Glenan gang, the Shanko butchers, the tit for tat sectarian killings and more. So, so by the mid 1970s, uh, the, the the situation was by and large set to degenerate into localized and demoralizing internal feuds, sectarian murders, so-called punishments, and the uh, and the murders of of or of supposed spies. In many cases, they weren't spies or double agents. They were just people who had been. Uh, who were suspected of being spies or double agents because of all the all pervading uh, paranoia that was going around, and they were taken out to a bog somewhere and they were shot. Um, and their families never found the bodies until after the end of the end of the end of the conflict. Um, there was also declining morale, and as I was said the all-pervading growth of suspicion and paranoia as the British intelligence slowly worked their way into the so-called foolproof cell structure, largely without the IRA or the INLA figuring out how they'd done it. So in a couple of years, our, oh, I'm sorry, British military intelligence was effectively influencing most of the law, not only most of the loyalist paramilitary actions, but it also had information and in some cases even acting double agents. 
on a fair proportion of IRA stroke INLA ones to boot. So in a sense, the British were running both sides. Uh, they weren't totally in control of IRA, INLA um, ones, of course, but they were, but they were in um, pretty much, they had much greater control over loyalist ones um and but but they even had and they were eventually to to have at the top level they were going to have uh, people in the in the ira stroke INLA. this was still to come um in county tyrone a farm owned by a senior ruc officer was to become infamous for the meetings that they held there these meetings of what was later to be known as the Glen Ann Gang uh, were to provoke as much containable sectarian terror as possible, and some of their victims can be seen above. Um, we have the Monaghan and Dublin car bombings in these pictures, and we have a whole lot of mainly Catholic people who were targeted by the um, on the on the northern side of the border, one or two on the southern side. Um, the Dublin Monaghan bombings were were um, extra 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 national. They were actually in in the Irish Republic, um, and the uh, and the assassination of the M Miami Show Band. Uh, you can see them on the bottom on the bottom right. They were um, they were what was known as the show band. Show bands were sort of they they played they played standard hit, hits of the of the time, and they would travel around. They played dance halls around the country, and uh, and the the um, and the, the the entire entire band was targeted for some inexplicable reason and wiped out. Um, the the uh, I think it was included a bomb and shootings, and the uh, and the the um, the entire members of the of the band were wiped out. So so the well, what was the point of all this? Well, it was to create an atmosphere of terror and to try and um, withdraw public support from the from the IRA. Uh, thanks to a reliable whistleblower who was involved, we now know that this gang operated with impunity uh, from the aforementioned border farm. Uh, it operated on both sides of the border, as uh, we've already indicated, and it included high rank members of the U UDR, the RUC and British military intelligence, who would all meet together in this farm to plan the next action. Um, the acts of terror were to, intended to provoke a full-scale sectarian bloodbath. Uh, this would eat up all the attention of the IRA and INLA and allow the British state to portray, portray the, the, uh, the, the different armed groups in conflict, the paramilitary groups in conflict with each other um, as common criminals, as though they were g gangs of mafia type people, and th th this became a, a trope that they tried to to impose upon upon the political conflict in 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 Northern Ireland. Um, the the ultimate the ultimate act of terror was actually eventually even the um, even the loyalist paramilitaries wouldn't take take part in it, and that was what put put a stop to to this this particular outfit. Um, but but their operations um, also involved the slaughter of civilians, as we've, we've mentioned, on the opposite side of the border, technically outside British jurisdiction. Um, this, these including the Dublin and Monaghan car bombings. You can see the aftermaths of um, one of those bombs 
um, up there on the uh, um, above. Um, and every all these all these incidents when when the when it was Catholics being shot at anyway they were all blamed on loyalist paramilitaries. Um, yes, loyalist paramilitaries were often involved as well, but their um, their the the masterminds were were uh, in working from places like this border farm where uh, high-ranking members of R RUC, R UDR, and British military intelligence were all sitting around a table and planning the next one. And then they got the loyalist paramilitaries to carry them out. Well, sometimes they, it wasn't loyalist paramilitaries, it was actually British, British, British soldiers, um, undercover British soldiers. So tit for tat sectarian killings were to be widely encouraged. Uh, this was all part of the escalation process. Uh, and one of the most horrific of these occurred near the village of Kingsmills in Armagh, where a busload of 11 workmen was stopped on a lonely country road by masked men. Uh, the masked men released the only Catholic worker and summarily gunned down the rest of them, who were all Protestants. We now know that this atrocity, uh, which was committed under a, a nom de plume, I think it was the Catholic Reaction Force or something like this, was indeed carried out by the provisional IRA, as was suspected, in fact, at the time. However, we also now know that the commanding officer of the provisional IRA unit involved was in fact simultaneously a British double agent. And he was much later exposed as such. This was after the conflict had ended. He was, his, um, his mask dropped at that point and um, he was exposed and he was quickly quickly spirited out of, out of the country, and we don't know where he is to this day. Um, so, but this man had carried on working for both sides in the, in the provisional IRA um, and in British military intelligence well into the 1980s. So who was he really working for at King's Mills? Well, we may never know. Um, similarly, the so-called Shanko Butchers, this was a gang organized in North Belfast by uh, Lenny Murphy. Uh, you can see him uh, on the left. He was a known uh, bully from school. Um, he'd apparently been picked on as a, as a kid. He was, he was obviously, um, the, 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 whole, the whole question of, of Lenny Murphy is uh, that uh, it is you know it, it, and, and the Shankill butchers is this is this a crime story or is this a political murder story? I would say it's a political murder story. Um, it's something like the death squads that operated in um, or still operate to this day in in parts of Latin America. Um, and um, and Murphy was known as a bully at at school. He uh, pulled a knife on somebody. Um, while he was still at school. Um, and then after he left, he joined the Ulster Volunteer Force. And uh, he 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 quickly organized his own outfit within the Ulster Volunteers Force. And, and then they carried out a series of quite gr uh, grotesque killings. So from 1972, to 1975, nine roughly, they killed at least 23 people. We don't, we still don't know the exact number that they were responsible for. Um, it was at least 19. Um, and most people say it's around about 23. And, but it could have been, it could be even more. And they were mostly Catholics whom they, they, they also killed Protestants who they thought were Catholics, by the way, um, by the mistaken identity. And um, 
they abducted them in in a taxi, uh, beat them mercilessly, and then butchered them with uh, uh, knives, cleavers, and hatchets. Uh, you can see some of the array of ones that were eventually found when the gang was finally busted. Um, there remains a deep suspicion that the police could have acted far quicker than they did to put a stop to the killings. As the gang was known about, but apparently able to act with impunity, despite Murphy being in jail, until their last victim miraculously escaped death and survived to pinpoint his attackers. Uh, Murphy was actually, um, as I say, he was, he, was, he was in jail at the time. He was directing these attacks uh, with his willing accomplices outside. Uh, the willing accomplices took the rap when they went to jail because they were afraid of him. Um, uh, because he was he was a he, he was a psychopath. There's no doubt about that. Uh, he'd already killed at, le at least two other um, loyalist paramilitaries who, who got a, who had crossed him. He'd he killed somebody in jail with cyanide, and he killed um, somebody else with with um, I think he shot him. So it's it's also odd that Murphy's actions fitted the purposes of the Kitson Doctrine. Um, it also is very strange that the, that the police, who had several leads that they could have followed up, never managed to to, to follow them up um, until it was to, until it was the, the the gang had obviously obviously made a mess. And um, they, they could no longer be hidden, hidden away. But they were basically fulfilling the Kitson doctrine of terrorizing the local population as much as possible. This man was perfect, perfect, perfect for for the role he was intended for. Um, so so although there is no smoking gun, as it were, to to uh, link Murphy to to the uh, to British intelligence in this period, we we highly suspect that this is the case, and um, and it'll it'll only be in decades to come that will that this will eventually trickle out into into the common arena. By which time, all the all the victims will be conveniently dead, and and there will be no more. Um, and there were no, and there were, uh, and there will be no compensation payouts to to make. Um, so, so that this is um, the Shanko butchers. Um, it's already been stated that civilians were, by and large, sick of the daily fear and stress of having to live in such an environment, and apart from the pol politically committed, most loyalty to paramilitary armed groups. Uh, arose from a begrudging sense of communal solidarity that was at all times in danger of wearing too thin. This was becoming increasingly the case uh, before, perhaps in, it had been more, more of a, a uh, um, it had been more of a, a, um, uh, a committed sense, but th this time it was by b by this point it was becoming much more begrudging, and um, and the the only the only reason why people were still supporting them was that they didn't trust the state. They they trusted the state even less. Uh, thus emerged the peace people, uh, so called, uh, who from. 1976 attempted to try and put a stop to the violence as they as they expressed it. Um, Betty Williams and Mairead Corrigan, you can see them on the right. Um, th these were the chief organizers, and it all arose out of an incident which uh, Corrigan uh, witnessed in person, where an IRA man 
in a car, was shot dead by British soldiers, and then the car had gone out of control, uh, crashing into three children on the curbside. Um, the, the, the group was quite middle class. Uh, certainly the leadership was quite middle class. And um, it received, on one hand, adulations from the state and the press. Um, but on the other, they were often beaten up by the communities that they tried to enter to, to spread their, their, their message. So, uh, and the peace people were also somewhat conflicted in terms of the practical politics that they were espousing. Because while some of their efforts should be seen with admiration, they did some good things. They, they um, for example, they, they, uh, they, they supported the idea that the, that the, that prisoners should have, have, have rights um, and that they 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 should 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 be allowed to have have visitors and 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 all these things, um, but other others of the things that they were talking about, they can only be described as at best naive, or at worst, complicit in the media circus and state interest that they had generated. Uh, the clincher came when Corrigan and Williams were offered the Nobel Peace Prize and they accepted the money for themselves rather than donating it to charity, for example. Corrigan later retracted, but the damage was already done. Uh, their actions had angered not by not only by an by an a by now cynical local populace, but had also alienated a large section of their fellow peace people, colleagues and allies. And of course, any good process of Ulsterization also requires other good stories for the media, apart from the outbreak of peace people. So up stepped opportunist engineer, John DeLorean, Californian con man, with more money than sense, but with enough sense to make even more money out of an all too willing British direct rule administration that was desperate to normalize the province as it was now called on BBC. This was another term that they were using to, to try and, and, um, and distance, distance the, or, or what was happening in, in Northern Ireland from any any uh, political context, so it was now to be known as the province rather than Northern Ireland or um, six counties or whatever. The Californian businessman uh, he charmed and conned the former into uh, the, he started with Roy Mason and then carried on with the Tories uh, into subsidizing his futuristic car factory to employ Catholics and Protestants on equal terms. So he said, and there was big fanfare, the, the, um, the factory was constructed and they, there was a few months of people actually working at it. But once, once this had subsided, um, DeLorean was in the meantime, he was, uh, he was, he was too busy enjoying the high life and he was he was uh he was indicted on criminal charges of smuggling cocaine in the US and into that gap fell his best Belfast venture which had to be sold off and the plant was uh was was broken down um and was dismantled and so this all ended on a rather embarrassing note for the Northern Ireland office Um, I should mention that far away and unrelated to any of this going on, a new youth culture movement was sub simultaneously arising in New York and London. It was soon to be dubbed as punk, and it was all about anarchic energy 
released in the form of simple two minute um, or three minute songs expressing anger, dis disaffection and disenchantment and affecting as shocking a dress or look as possible to go with it. So on one hand, uh, Northern Ireland seemed about the last place where a movement like this could catch on, but catch on it did. And it spread out of a few alternative record shops such as Good Vibrations in Belfast and a handful of supportive music venues. Uh, and especially after the success of bands such as The Clash, London Band, which you can see on the right there, um, the Ulster, so-called Ulster punk movement took off. Uh, of seminal influence was, was a visit of The Clash to, to Belfast. Um, this was in 1978, and publicity shots of the band were taken next to uh next to armored cars and British soldiers and things like this here to 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 um it was a publicity exercise basically um but but the band were forbidden to play they they had a had a gig booked in I think it was the Ulster Hall and they weren't allowed to play there because uh there was uh, there was a big folk devils and moral moral panics have been whipped up about the punks and what a threat they were to to um civilized society and all the rest of it so their their gig was cancelled uh youth from all backgrounds their minds full of whatever they wanted to say about their lives um, often in quite an explicit manner in sexual terms and all the rest of it, and the DIY ethos of the punk movement, and inspired by treasured vinyl singles, um, either from 60s um, proto-punk bands or from, uh, from the, the, um, the, the current punk movement, they they gravitated towards uh, such venues such as the Pound, uh, which you can see above, um, and the Heart Bar, which you can see on the right. Now, this is quite typical of what a, a bar in Belfast looked like at the time. Uh, this was the sort of defences which they put up because bars were prime target for 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 bombings. Um, and for for shoot um, people coming in to shoot shoot people, so so the the idea was that if you put all these wire mesh, you you if you you barred the windows and you put up um, wire wire mesh screens outside and let people in only one at a time, then you would limit limit the um, the casualty rate. That was what I was thought. So that, that, that was what the heart bar looked like. Um, uh, the, 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 the cows bar in Derry was another one. Uh, so, and um, yeah, and you went there to, to watch the latest band to appear in the scene or even to perform your own, your first ever, ever gig. Uh, the movement was not overly political. And in most cases, it was the direct opposite. However, what the bands shared in common was an opposition to the restricted, repressed life that young people had to endure in the six counties and in Ireland in general, in fact. Um, and this, this, uh, the influence of this, and also there were other bands in Dublin that were doing similar sort of things. Um, uh, this, this showed a, a healthy disregard for sectarianism, politics with a capital P, um, religion, etc. In a few cases, however, the loose association of the punk rock movement with anarchy, in scare quotes, were to have a lasting effect. We can deal with that more in part six. So most of these bands sadly lasted only a year or two and disappeared. Others became part of the now niche markets for 
punk or a new wave as capitalism attempted to neuter the threat of the movement in uh, to make it conform to the established order um, or as the clash might have termed it from drawing inspiration from one of their lyrics turning rebellion into money however two two of these bands were to gain near superstar status from two of these northern ireland bands namely stiff little fingers whom you can see above they're from belfast and the undertones from derry uh, on the right now both of these bands unlike uh, quite a lot of the other other bands did attempt to grapple with the wider political turmoil that they'd grown up in, but they did so in very different ways. Um, the stiff little fingers were, were pretty were very much in your face, um, and they there was no ambiguity about what they were talking about. With the undertones, it was a they were very subtle about it. Right, we're now going to talk about the prison protests. So the icing on the cake of a so far successful British austerization policy was to prove its undoing. If you recall, most of its most of the things it intended to achieve had in fact been been achieved by the end of the 1970s. But um, the its undoing was to be the Diplock Court system. Now this was uh, this is in Belfast High Court, um, which you can see in the picture above. This is where these the trials in scare quotes were carried out, under which tortured suspects with or without confessions could be processed through judge only, I know jury trials, <clears throat> and turned into criminals. So obviously there's something deeply flawed about a um, so-called democratic society where you have to have judge only um, and no jury trials. Uh, but but this was all part of the of the contradiction involved. It now focused the attention of the struggle onto the prisoners and their demands for political status. Sim so simultaneously with the conveyor belt court system just described, the prisoners still in Longkesh prison camp were also to be processed. If you remember, Longkesh prison camp is um, was the, the there was an old airfield, uh, Second World War air, airfield, on the outskirts of East Belfast, where where the where the prisoners were kept. And and they were um, uh, and but they they but they'd been been treated as political prisoners. So they so they were allowed to wear their own clothes. They were allowed to to run classes. They were allowed to to um, basically be completely self self governing within the prison. But this was all to change. They were to be moved to a new high security prison called the H-Blocks. Uh, these were uh, these are, were still at Longkesh area, but they were renamed for criminalization purposes as the Maze. So they were building this from the mid 1970s and by the late 1970s, they're ready to move people into them. So once arrived, the the um, the prisoners, whether coming directly from the Diplock courts or whether they were going into into the, into the prison system, for, they were being reprocessed from Longkesh. They were deprived of their normal clothes, and they were given a set of prison clothes to wear. And the prisoners naturally refused to wear these, and in this way, the first blanket protest began right we can see the h blocks you can see why they were called h blocks um some some of these h blocks had loyalist prisoners and some had republican prisoners and most of them had republican prisoners but i think a couple of them had loyalist prisoners 
Uh, you can also see how intensive security was. I don't think anybody or maybe not more than one or two people escaped throughout its entire, entire existence. Uh, you can see double, triple walls in, around it. And right off the bottom of the picture, which you can't see, here is the is the airfield that they um, the converted airfield with the Nissan huts where the original prison camp had been. So the prisoners wore only a blanket as a mark of their protest. And outside the jails, uh, their families and supporters st started to raise local awareness. Despite the growing public outcry, the prison authorities proved to be intransigent, as by now the whole of British Northern Ireland policy was in fact hinged on it. So this forced the prisoners to escalate their protest and refused to slop out, meaning that they no longer handled their cell excrement. The, the stink in the prison bucket became unbearable and the inmates were forced to smear the contents on the walls as a desperate measure, you can see that on the right. Um, so this was the what was known as the dirty protest. So, so these were two prisoners who were photographed. They smuggled the camera in, and um, and they uh, and the pictures were were taken, and um, and and they got the pictures out again. The conditions which the men lived in is hard to describe. Uh, they made up for it the best they could by breaking the cell windows. They they couldn't communicate to each other in any other way because the the new new prison was such such high security that um, that the even um, that the, the the there was no way that set one cell could communicate to to the other cell very easily. Um, and and they were only allowed out for an hour a day. Um, so they so they broke the cell windows so that they could carry on a twenty four seven con conversation. Um, and, uh, and 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 they did this with shout, shouting in in Irish. So they 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 learned um, a dialect of the of the Irish language, which today is known as the Jelta. Um, which is uh, which is a play on the on the Gaeltach being being the Irish speaking areas in the west of Ireland. So they did this and they sang songs to each other constantly, and they told jokes, and they delivered lectures, um, engaged in political discussions. This is both the IRA, both the provosts and the INLA were prisoners were very close by this point, um, and they were going to have a big impact on on each other. In fact, in the in the inside inside the inside inside the jails, for far more than outside. And um, so. In the course of their incarceration, Republican prisoners, mostly from working class backgrounds, became highly educated and literate. Um, and many of them achieved uh, very high, high level degrees in a wide range of different topics. Uh, the, as I say, the humor was hugely important in this, in this uh, environment. It's one critique I would say of um, of the of the movie made about it. It's otherwise very good, but it makes out that these guys were just uh, like really stoical and and that they they uh, didn't have I didn't have any sense of you that they were just um, they're all always seen as very stern faced and all the rest of it. Actually, for most of the time, in order to stay sane, they they were constantly making jokes, both of each other and of the uh, and of the situation and of the of the uh, um, of the of the prison staff. So, so you do have to realize this. 
Um, it's not as it, it wasn't as grim in in terms of their expressions as it looks. Um, female Republican prisoners at Armagh Prison. You can see Mairead Farrell. She's on the left. Um, uh, they came out in solidarity with with the men. They uh, were actually, I think, they were still in uh, civilian clothing. Uh, they the prison authorities hadn't moved on them yet, but they were intending to presumably. But um, the, the, they were still dealing with the men, and then they thought they that they could move on. Once they dealt with the men, they could, then they could move on to the woman. But instead, what happened was the woman came out in support of them. Um, and although they're in their own clothes, they they uh, they had to. Well, they um, so they so they didn't need to join the blanket, but they did join in the dirty protest, and you can see the results of. Uh, Mairead Farrell being in the dirty protest in her cell. Once again, this this photograph was smuggled smuggled out. Um, and prison warders at both the H blocks and Armagh were in reprisal moves by the state, encouraged to inflict further suffering and take out their frustrations on the prisoners. Um, loyalist prisoners caught in the contradiction of the, their beliefs. Uh, their beliefs were in the British state, the British state could do no wrong and all the rest of it, but, but they were being treated, processed and um, maltreated in the same way as Republican prisoners were, more or less, um, if, they, if they protested. And um, so the loyalist pr prisoners... Um, couldn't make it their minds up and they oscillated constantly between uh joining in the protests um only to leave them again a few days later um as the 1970s was drawing to close the ira began to recover a semblance of the audacity that they had previously enjoyed the warren point and narrow water joint attacks the first one on the parachute regiment. Uh, I think there were 10 parachute regiment soldiers killed in this incident. And on Lord Mountbatten, who was in a boat at this, exactly the same time, he was uh, he was uh, uh, in his in his uh, jet boat in the um, in in the uh, in Carlingford Loch, and. Uh, the RA had a bomb on board and exploded it, uh, killing Mountbatten and a couple of members of his family. Uh, this proved that despite everything, the organization was still one to reckon with. So the British, despite all their successes, were not as successful as they had hoped. Um, and because the, 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 they weren't expecting this one coming, they didn't see it coming. And uh, it got past all the double agents and all the rest of it. And um, and the British establishment had also received a very bad shock with the Mountbatten killing in particular because she he was related to to um, to the current queen. Uh, more normal, however, were the attacks on the RUC and UDR. And these, of course, were much easier to be used as fuel to to uh, propagate the the prop the the, uh, the the concept of it being sectarian war, and also to fuel local sectarian hatred. A change of focus in targeting screws was now used so as a new tactic. Um, this was to support the prisoners' struggle inside because the prisoners were being really badly treated by the by the screws, by and large. So um, the the IRA outside or INLA outside felt that they had to do something. So the fa favored routine was to attach a device to the prison car warder's car so that it detonated on his way to work. Not a very nice way to go, but then again, you know. He was involved in a war and he was taking an active part in it. They, they only killed 
prison warders who were known to be particularly sadistic. Um, the Republican prisoners campaign had escalated to the old last resort tactic of the hunger strike. Now, this is an old um, old tactic of the of RA prisoners that goes right back to the 1920s. Um, and uh, the it, it, and so so it has a has a history. It possibly even the his, history of the hunger strike really goes back to ancient Irish society, but we won't we won't go there. Um, but entered into in in 1980, the idea the idea being being basically that um, if your back's to the wall, you've got no other means of of uh, of expressing the, the injustice that is going on, then then you go into into a hunger strike. So. Um, the first hunger strike was entered into in 1980, and it seemed to be on achieving a recognition of the prisoners' demands with the Northern Ireland office. Uh, and the first hunger strike was therefore called off because there seemed to be negotiations going on, and the British government seemed to be wanting to um, to concede political status to the prisoners. Uh, but the then recently strengthened British Prime Minister, that's Margaret Thatcher, whom you can see in the picture above, uh, was determined to not give an inch as part of the, her cultivation of this lady is not for turning uh, political persona that she was trying to project uh, to make her look tough. And her personal intervention in the apparently resolving dispute he, she uh, replaced, I think, the the uh, the the uh, minister for the Northern Ireland office with with uh, somebody who was much more hardline, and this was to prove disastrous. Uh, so began the second of the two hunger strikes, and this was this so so so, they, so the so prisoners once they realised that the that the British were not going to uh, be um tagging them along and and we're not we're not um going to offer anything they they felt that they had to go back onto the hunger strike so and and the, the second of the hunger strikes uh began before the bodies of the participants in the first one had had time to recover so they died relatively soon into the hunger strike usually hunger strike takes much longer to for people to die but um, not if you've already been through one just very recently. Uh, realizing how potentially close many of the men were to death already, the movement outside of the prisons expanded hugely. It dwarfed previous expectations. In nationalist areas, the, the streets were literally flooded. And the same was true in the in the Republic. We've already seen um, a picture of how big it was. Uh, not only were some of the British elites now worried, but also those in Dublin, recalling the last time a crowd had stormed and sacked the British embassy. They actually burned it to the ground in 1972 after Bloody Sunday. And provisional Sinn Féin, uh, was also concerned, actually. Uh, not so much. Not so much attention is is paid to this, but the uh, provisional Sinn Fein were are a remain to this day. I'm afraid a hierarchical organization, and they are very, very um, uh, afraid and wary of anything that's outside their control. Um, and this is is seen as being a problem. A problem. And technically, although they had some influence over the prisoners because they were part of the same organization, essentially the prisoners in, in the jails were doing their own thing. And the and Sinn Fein had to toe the line of the of the um of the of the prisoners. 
and um, and uh, and they so so they were uncomfortable too, and this is this is something worth worth thinking about. So we can see two two pictures of the hunger strike demonstrations here. Um, this one is in a very typically wet Northern Ireland day, and um, and the people are out with the pictures of the of, of the of the ones who are closest to death um, at, at the front of the at the front of the march. There's Bobby Sands and Patsy O'Hara and Francis Hughes and a couple of other people. Um, this is this is a this is I think it's just after Bobby Sands died. So um, so so this is this is like the people getting angry about it. So coming out out onto the streets, overturning cars, setting them on fire, getting into conflict with the police and army. So the British state's reaction to the upsurge of popular discontent was predictable enough. Um, this was what they'd always done. So they, they escalated the targeted assassinations of anybody it viewed as the ringleaders of such a dangerous movement. And they now had the intelligence and all the rest of it and the, and the infiltration levels in, 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 to enable them to do it. So they, so they used the same means as they built up before. Uh, the fact that the H-Block committees and the campaign were actually leaderless um, seems to be an incomprehensible to the orchestrators of state violence. So high profile individuals had to be selected for mur murder regardless of how, how um, influential they could be on the, on the outcome. Uh, we can see three of those victims above. Uh, the, these were state death squads, basically. Once again, loyalist paramilitaries were blamed, but the but they were orchestrated by the state, including military intelligence and probably the SAS. From the left is Myra Drum. Uh, she was provisional, a very outspoken uh, provisional Sinn Féin activist. Uh, she was targeted because she was so outspoken. Uh, Ronnie Bunting Jr. He was hated because he was Protestant and also a socialist Republican. Um, and he was then the acting chief of staff of the Irish National Liberation Army, the INLA. And Miriam Daly, uh, who is a lecturer at Queen's University of Belfast. And she was a tireless IRSP activist. So she was an academic, basically. Uh, Bernadette Devlin Michalski was also targeted. Um, and she narrowly survived an attack on her home. Uh, she was in, in, she was actually badly wounded. She was in, in crutches uh, in, the, in the year or so afterwards. So in episode three, we, um, or rather episode four, um, we had uh, already discovered, discussed the use of rubber bullets as a means of state terror. By the late 1970s, they had been replaced by the smaller, but even harder and more deadly plastic bullet. In their efforts to restore order in the streets, the RUC and the British Army in 1981, during the demonstration or in, in the context of the demonstrations, discharged thousands of them. And in particular, they, they seem to have targeted children. In all, about four to five were killed in 1981 with deliberate headshots. Um, and these were almost entirely children who were not involved in any trouble. They were just on their way home um, or playing with other children or whatever. And they were definitely deliberate, deliberate targets. Um, it was, you know, it wasn't any trouble going on. They, uh, and then somebody would lean out of a armored car 
or um, far for the division slot, and and that would be that a point blank range. It was assumed that the deaths of the children um, would make the natives more compliant, as if that would happen. So Carol Ann Kelly, she's the example I've chosen. She is on the left. Um, she was one of the victims. Um, she was seven years old and she returned home from school one day um, and she was on her way back to, to, to the house and she was shot in the head at very close range from an armoured car um, at the side of the road. No trouble going on, no, no, no riots, nothing. Um, the, the vehicle it contained the, uh, the inquest was to reveal no less than a, an assistant chief constable of the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Surely it can't have been an accident then. It must have been deliberate. So all the while the negotiations with the British government were um, went on and on and on, uh, people were dying and the negotiations went on and on um, without any resolution. Uh, th there was a, a near breakthrough, um, but that was abandoned at the last minute. So in the end, the uh, resolution of the prisoners was to continue because they couldn't really do anything else. Um, and it was broken uh, by only by pressure from, from their families. And this was encouraged by the Catholic Church, uh, especially an individual known as Father Fall, who was on one, on one hand, he was quite a conflicted individual. On one hand, he was, uh, he was uh, in support of the prisoners. He did a lot of things for the prisoners, but he also did, um, he also betrayed them. So, um, so you can see the most famous of our of the of the ten hunger strikers who were to die. It's Bobby Sands, MP, on the uh, above there, um, and after in his last in, in his last days there on the right, so you can see how much he changed. Um, and and that that picture I think was taken in between him coming out of. Uh, there was a short period when he was uh, he, he was in Longkesh as well, the um, the the prison camp, and then he went um, he went out. Uh, I, I think I think this is where while he's he's out um, out of jail for a brief period before he's back in jail through the diplomat lock courts and all the rest of it. Um, so, so what had all this been for? Um, because, you know, the, there were 10, 10 prisoners, there were th seven provisionals and three INLA prisoners. And, um, and, the, and the British government had seen, what we know is that after, uh, after, the, after the prison uh, hunger strike had, had collapsed, a few weeks later, the British government secretly granted granted nearly all of the prisoners' demands. So what were they at? What had it all been for? These questions, of course, will remain unanswered. That's it finished, folks.